25, one verse, the last verse in the book of Judges. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you can find this on page 221 in the Pew Bible. It's that black book right in front of you. Uh, if you're kind of new to the scriptures, uh, it's fairly early in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So what is that fifth book, no, sixth book in uh, Joshua, or Judges 21, 25. Um, so I've become increasingly aware in recent years that at least in our country, if not in the West, if not across the globe, that we're struggling with a leadership vacuum. I'm not sure all of why that is, but I think it's definitely true. It, it shows up all over the place. It shows up in politics. It shows up in the churches. It shows up in families. It shows up in businesses. Uh, some of it may be uh, the baby boomers not uh, doing a very good job of um, equipping folks to follow them and just hanging on to their role uh, rather than uh, uh, working to think uh, I'm going to die and somebody's going to have to follow me. I'm not, I'm not sure all of, all of why. I do think there's a fear and reluctance of leadership because, because our culture has kind of grown in its contempt for authority. I think a lot of people who might really be gifted and capable leaders are a little afraid of it because they know the kind of hits they're going to take if they embrace it. Uh, I'm not sure all of why, but I'm quite confident it's a reality. And, and it's not just a reality that, that shows up out there. It's a reality that shows up in here with, with us. Uh, we planted Jennings Creek Community Church uh, just almost to the day two years ago. And one of the phrases I used, I haven't come back to it much, but in those days was next man up. We're sending out some really wonderful uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need next man up in leadership and in service, and next woman up in leadership and service, because uh, they created a vacuum by their departure. Uh, that vacuum for us filled a great need in a really needy community, and it is gloriously and beautifully. So I have no regret about that at all. Uh, but I just want to encourage you as we kick off really a new series today. So this is a setup for the first Samuel series. I'll be, begin working through that two weeks from the day, September the 8th. And uh, it's really going to be not entirely, but consistently about this issue. It's really what first Samuel's about. There was a vacuum of leadership definitely in the times of the judges and on into the time of First Samuel. It was similar to our day in many ways. And we need to have an awareness of that. And we need to be asking the Lord, what, what is my responsibility with respect to this issue? Uh, it, really, it really does, really does matter, and it matters a lot. Now, not only am I setting up, but I think we've had judges set up for us. Many of you uh, were here when Dr. Abe Curavilla was with us back in February, and he preached the entire revival series out of Judges. And it kind of set the table for what I'm trying to do today and what we'll be doing moving forward, if, uh, if you remember that. So, um, Judges 21, 25. This is the word of the Lord. Let's honor it by standing. In, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Let's pray. Father, the days of the judges were dark, and so it seems are our days. And to what extent we are complicit in it. We pray that you would grant us repentance. You would convict us and draw us back to you and back to our responsibilities. Forgive us when we have misjudged what is right by our own blindness. 
and nearsightedness and double vision. Help us with these things today. And not only do we pray that you would heal us, but we pray that you would heal our land. Um, we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You can take your seat. We're going to think about this one little verse on two fronts today, just two fronts. And both of these things, I think, are the major thrust about, uh, of what the writer of Judges is doing in this little verse. The first thing is interpreting those days, interpreting those days, or interpreting the days. Uh, now, it's really important that, it, that he do that, because, that he does that, because if, if you read through Judges, it's, it's a mess. It, it's pretty messy at the beginning, it's real messy in the middle, and by the end, it's shockingly messy. It just is all the way through with some little blips of a little better, but it's, it's a dark book. And the, and the people of God are doing all kinds of things that they ought not to be doing. Uh, but the writer of the Judges, he, he, he really wants to take pains to let you know that what they've been doing is not what they're supposed to be doing. When you read your Bible, one of the big questions is when you see the people of God doing something, uh, you might think, well, this is a description of what they're doing. Does it follow then that it is a prescription for what I ought to do? That's a really important question to ask. And sometimes the answer is absolutely. Often in the book of Acts, when you see the people of God described doing things, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, and those kinds of things, the Apostle Peter, often what you see them doing is by the Holy Spirit being prescribed for you. Go and you do the same thing. But sometimes in the Bible, everything that's described is not prescribed. There are a lot of horrible things recounted in the Bible that you should stay a million miles away from. Just because it's described doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. So the writer of Judges takes pains by the Spirit to make it clear. All of this stuff I've been talking about, it was not okay. <laughs> and so he's interpreting what's going on. Uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There was no centralized authority in a monarchy or a king. Because there wasn't, everyone was left to do whatever they thought was best. Now, we've got to think through the, the, the kind of broader Old Testament story to understand what's going on here. So, uh, the process kind of began leading up to the judges and into the judges with good leadership. There were good leaders. You had Moses, and Moses was really concerned with what would happen after he was gone when the Lord said, you're not going into the promised land. He was concerned about that. He was concerned that the people of God would be harassed and helpless like sh they'd be like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to invest in Joshua. The Lord raised up Joshua. Joshua was a good leader. And then Joshua dies, and the people lapse. And then God raises up Othniel, and he's a good leader. And then after that, not so good. And Dr. Curavilla's thesis when he was with us is uh, that it went from bad to worse. That after Othniel, Ehud was a mess, and Barak maybe a little worse, Gideon worse, and all the way down the line, Jephthah worse until you get to Samson, who's an absolute train wreck. Now, you might not buy his thesis. I'm still struggling with it some. But I think generally speaking, that's, that's kind of the way that thing rolled. The judges were not only supposed to be military leaders, they were, also supposed to, they were also supposed to make judgments when the people of God needed direction and counsel. They were supposed to do it. When you read the book of Judges, do you see anybody doing that? I mean, do you remember Samson ever sort of sitting down with the elders of a community in Israel and saying, hey guys, you need to really step it up in this area, correcting them about this? It, Samson never does that. You don't see Jephthah or Abimelech or Ehud certainly doesn't do it. There's only one that does it. Do you know who it is? Anybody know? Deborah. <laughs> Deborah's, the, Deborah's the only one. I'm not going to make any big gender point by that, but it is noteworthy. She's the only one that does it. No, none of the other ones do that. 
when you get into 1 Samuel, you're still sort of in the times of the judges, and Eli does it a little, but very, very poorly. And then Samuel does it, and he does it well. And so, you've got this mess of bad leadership going to worse leadership framed by two really good leaders. And all of that storyline sets the table for a king that God would raise up and that ultimately would foreshadow his son. Good leaders, bad to worse leaders, and then no leaders. No leaders. When you get to the end, once Samson dies of this book, nobody's leading, nobody's judging, nobody is even trying, and people are just doing whatever seems right to them. And it's, and it's an absolute mess. There's, there, in, the, in the earlier part of Judges, you've got assassination, you've got idolatry, you've got torture, you've got hubris. All of that is horrible. You've got child sacrifice. And then, and then later on, you, you've got with Samson, you've got revenge, you've got blatant sexual immorality with little, if any, restraint. And then after that, what do you have? You've got idolatry again. You've got setting up uh, the worship of God, sort of, uh, just however anybody wants to. I think I'll make this guy a priest. You've got gang sexual assault. You've got a man who was supposed to defend his wife, but really putting his wife in a position to defend him. And it's not only assault, but it's murder. I won't give you the details of some of the other horrors, but there's two attempts at genocide with Gibeah and then with Jabesh Gilead. There's forced marriage. There's kidnapping. It's horrible. And the writer of Judges is saying this is why it was horrible. There was no central authority. There's no proper leader. And, and everyone le is left to themselves to do what is right in their own eyes. Now, let's just walk back real quickly. And let me just see that. I want you to see that this last verse is not the only place that it happens. So, if, if you go back to uh, chapter 14, I believe it is. You just turn with me a little bit and look at verse 3. Uh, Samson falls in love with uh, uh, a daughter of the Philistines who came from Timnah. And uh, his parents protest and say, you know, can't you find a good Jewish girl? And in verse 3 answers, Samson answers, but Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Same phrase that shows up later. She is right in my eyes. That, that's the first hint of it. Here's the judge, supposed to be a leader. He's doing what's right in his own eyes. And then uh, you get to chapter uh, 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every did what, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, exactly, 21, 25. 18, 1, in those days, there was no king in Israel. 19, 1. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts. And so you have it hinted and then stated explicitly and then come back to, and then the whole book ends with it. Uh, the Holy Spirit is saying to us, none of this was okay. I didn't authorize this stuff. This is horrible. And this is the fruit of what happens when people do what feels right to them. Does it sound familiar to you? Do you think that goes on any in our day? Thoughts and emotions untethered by Scripture going wherever they want to go, doing whatever feels right, seems right in their own eyes. Now, now if you paid attention to Hollywood, you would be thinking that... Um, that this would be a good thing, that a description like this, 
There's no king. Authority is a bad thing. It's horrible. It's good that there's no king. Topple the king. Everyone should do what's right in their own eyes. They should follow the dictates of their own conscience. If they did that, it would be great. That's modern culture's assessment. And I want to tell you something. It's all over the place. We, 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 we watch Hallmark movies sometimes. We like, Lisa likes them. I'm up, I'm up for it. I, I am. I, I like, I'm a, I'm a romantic. And they tend to end well romantically. They always do. But even in those that seems to be largely wholesome compared to everything else, What's the mantra in a Hallmark movie every time? Follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart. And to deny your heart is horrible, and to follow your heart is good and virtuous and wonderful. That's, it's in, if it's not in every one of them, it's real, real close. We swim in this stuff, and it feels so right. But it's not right. Jeremiah chapter 17. Just listen to what Scripture says here. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good. He shall dwell in the parched places, the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its Leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Why do your eyes not see rightly? Because your heart is messed up. And you're seeing, and you're interpreting, and you're framing with the eyes of your heart. And if your heart is off, then it will be off. Or if you prefer Proverbs 3 to Jeremiah 17, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You you really don't need to be trusting what seems right in your own eyes. And so he's taking pains to interpret this was all horrible and this is why. Now, do you do this any? Are you doing this? Maybe you think, okay, uh, but they were untethered from Scripture. I'm tethered to Scripture. I have a Christian conscience. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Okay, I can follow you down that path a ways. I I really can. So we're both sinners and saints, aren't we? And, And so... As we follow Scripture, as we seek to follow Christ, it informs our conscience and it helps us. But we need to be really careful and cautious, and we don't need to be soloing like they were on these things. When we're facing difficult choices and decisions, we need to make those tethered to Scripture, and we need to make those in the context of Christian community. We need to make it with our brothers and sisters, not all by ourselves. The last judge of judges is Samson. And Samson is absolutely going solo. His parents give him counsel. No, nope, not doing this. Looks right to me. And then when he starts leading, he's really not leading. Have you ever noticed with Samson's story? He doesn't call the troops together and lead them out into battle. He just goes and kills all the Philistines by himself. It's, it's, it's all unilateral. It's all alone. He's cut off. And the only times he gets close human contact, it's illicit, isn't it? And it ends up being his downfall, his undoing. So you need to be suspicious of your own heart just because your heart is inclined in a direction. You know, the psalmist in the 119th says, incline my heart to your testimonies. He prays that way. He's acknowledging, left to itself, my heart would never incline to this book. It would incline a thousand different things, a thousand different directions, but it wouldn't incline here. Lord, I can't even make myself want to read and study and memorize and meditate. My heart won't do it. You incline my heart. You help me. 
Be suspicious of your own heart. Don't trust your own take, your own read. I, I can't not tell you how many times I've read the deconstruction stories or just the uh, moves from a, a form of Christianity, uh, a, an orthodox form of Christianity into an unorthodox form, and it goes something like this. I have this experience, and out of that experience, then I adjust my doctrine and my theology to meet my experience. This happens, and I feel this way about it, and because I feel this way about it, and my heart feels this way, then all of a sudden my theology, my doctrine, my belief system must be adjusted to make room for what I'm feeling. Loved ones, that is not Christianity. That's the exact same way the world lives. Now, maybe you have a few boundaries out there that you are sure that you would not cross based on your experience, but in a thousand ways you could be make it crossing little boundaries with the, with the same kind of logic where the emotion drives it rather than Scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 18, Moses warning them about what was, will happen. He, he he says, and you, and you will do what is, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. And then he goes on and says, and you'll go in and take possession of the land by thrusting out your enemies as the Lord has promised. Well, <laughs> did they go in and do what was right and good? In the sight of the Lord, that's what Moses said was supposed to happen. But loved ones, that's the sight. That's the sight that matters. And the answer to Samson's claim, she's right in my eyes, would have been, well, son, is she right in the Lord's eyes? Because what seems right in your eyes, it, it really, with all due respect, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is his sight. The one who's absolutely omniscient, that sees everything to the bottom, that is perfectly wise over all things. It, it, it's his sight that matters, and nobody else's. So you want to seek his vantage point. And the amazing thing, loved ones, is that in this book, he's given it to us. He's given us so much of his sight, of what he sees as right and good. All you got to do is open the book and read, and he'll give you his wisdom. He doesn't give you everything. The things revealed belong to us and our children. The secret things belong to God, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But well, there's a lot of things revealed. Why would you not avail yourself? Why would you trust your own heart, your own read, your own feelings about it and refuse to follow his counsel, even to Look at his counsel. That's the first thing in, in interpreting. The second way to look at the text, or the second thing the writer is doing here, is he as, is anticipating the king. Interpreting the days, anticipating the king. The introduction of a king here uh, doesn't come in from nowhere. It's anticipating, and it's setting the table. In the Hebrew Bible, Ruth is moved somewhere else. So, in the Hebrew Bible, Ruth is over with the writings, with Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all that. So, it's plucked out of there. Chronologically, it, it, it fits where it's located in our Bible, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's pulled out of that. So, the last verse of Judges is the last verse of the Bible before 1 Samuel begins. And it's setting the table. And it's a story about how God's people will have a king and how they will have a leader. And so it anticipates that. In those days there was no king in Israel, but the inference is, but soon there's going to be. There's going to be. And the Lord had left instruction about the king. So I want us to spend uh, the rest of our time in Deuteronomy 17. So just turn over there and let's walk through it and let's uh, think about. And I want you through this series and certainly in the sermon as we move toward the close of it, I really want you to think about what kind of leader do I want to follow? What kind of leader do I want to be? What kind of leader should I be? And you're saying, well, 
I'm not a leader. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you are. Um, you're, you're leading. Maybe a Sunday school class, maybe an elder, a deacon, maybe a mom or a dad, maybe a husband. Maybe your baby girl in your family, and you think, I don't lead anybody. My older brother and sister, they rule me. My parents do. Do you have friends? Leadership is just influence. It's, it's much of what we mean when we say Richmond exists to glorify God and make disciples. Does your leadership point people to Jesus? In your leadership, are you following him and calling other people to follow him? So, I'm a little brother, but I've been my big sister's pastor for years. And uh, so, she led me a lot. She still does some. I've been in a position to lead her. Uh, Herb and I often have a tiger by the tail there, I think. But, but anyway, <laughs> um, so even, even if you're a baby child, just wherever you are, you're giving leadership somewhere. It, it's not, am I a leader? It, it is, am I a good one? Am I a faithful one? What kind of leader do I want to follow? What kind of leader do I want to be? Um, so, laws about kings. When you come to the land, this is verse 14, that the Lord your God has given you, and, and, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So the setup is for the people of God choosing a king and how that's to be. And then begins to require things of the king. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Do you hear that phrase, for himself, for himself, for himself? There are to be restraints on this. Not too many wives, not too much gold and silver, not too many horses. And if you've got to have some horses, don't get them from Egypt. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priesthood. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of his law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not return aside or turn aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel." first thing about the king that Israel was supposed to have and the kind of leader we need and ought to have is self-leadership. So much of this is not about what's, what the king would do for Israel. It was how he's going to be. Less what he's going to do and more what kind of man is he going to be. Is he going to be for himself or for his subjects? And if he is for himself at all, does he understand the wise way to properly be for yourself? Because for himself shows up in verse 18 too, in a book of, copy, of a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priesthood. Read the Bible for yourself. That's not the only reason you read it, but that's one reason you read it. And he needed to. Self-leadership. Those judges were failures at self-leadership. Samson couldn't lead himself. He certainly wasn't going to lead Israel. And Jephthah and Ehud, they, they weren't good leaders. And as you read the story, and Dr. Curavillas, one of his major points was, as go the leaders, so go the people. Poor leadership tends to have poor following. It's, it's a mess. Can you lead yourself? You know, in the qualifications for elders in the New Testament in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, you know what's in both of them? Self-control. Self-control. A brother needs to know how to lead himself before he can lead the flock. And it talks about managing his household well, which means he needs to have enough self-control to lead his family well. And if he does that well, then maybe he has enough self-control to lead the church of God well. But both those things matter. And in Titus, in the second chapter, he starts talking to older men, younger men, older women, and in all of them, Self-control shows up. Can you lead yourself? Can you lead yourself? 
It's, it's absolutely crucial. You can't take anybody where you haven't gone. Self-leadership is crucial. And then, and then he was also to lead with humility, with humility. Did you see it in verse 20? That his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers. Even though he's the king, he's not supposed to, what does it say in 1 Peter chapter 5 to the elders? Not lording it over those entrusted to your care, but being examples to the flock. Humility is crucial for leadership. How is your self-leadership? How is your humility? Oh, some of you are saying, oh, I'm so humble. I'm the best at humility. I'm, I'm so good. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, are you frequently convicted about your pride? That's the way to grow to humility, to see how proud you are and how it stinks and how it hinders and ruins and spoils. Mr. Self loves to show up and loves the accolades. You've got to constantly be attacking him or her to lead with humility. And then lead with the word. Lead with the word. He's supposed to transcribe the law. He's supposed to write it down. Do you know how much that, do you know how long that would take? I mean, it's Hebrews right to left, so he's transcribing right to left the entire book of Deuteronomy, perhaps the entire Pentateuch, five chapters. And then not only that, he has to do it a little bit. The Levites have to come check it out. And they would say, hey, you messed that up. You've got to start all over. I mean, that's, that's like they took such pains with the Scriptures that they would do that. And so is he reading the Bible? Yes. Is he reading the Bible in community? Yeah, he's the king. His authority over the Levites, but he's put himself under the Levites with respect to Scripture, which he desperately needed to do. Do you lead with the Word? Brothers, how's it going? Family worship happening in your home? You praying with your wife? You reading Scripture in your home? Do you guys sing the praises of God at home? What's going on there? Is it Word-centered? Ephesians chapter 5, describing the love of Christ for his bride and encouraging husbands with respect to that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her and make her holy by the washing of water by the word, that she might be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing or without blemish. That's not a quote, but that's the, that's the track Paul is running on there. Uh, brothers, are you leading in the home? By the word in your spiritual friendships that are designed to strengthen your brother or sister or discipling relationship, is, is it word-centered? Is the word showing up? And then, and then, and then a fourth thing, and there's, there's more we could say here, but uh, it, it's, it's, he, he leads for their flourishing, for their flourishing, uh, or leads them into flourishing. If you go to 2 Samuel... Near the very end, Samuel was one book. Don't worry. I don't think I'm going to preach through the whole book, First and Second Samuel, but it, it, but it is one book. We just divide it up because it's really long. If you don't, but it's one book, and it's and it's and it's structured with poems or songs. There's a song early from Hannah. There's a song in the middle from David, uh, how the mighty have fallen. There's a song at the end from David, and I want you to just hear something of the last song. Now, these are the last words of David, verse 1, and then verse 3. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. What What is that about? Good godly leadership is is the for, for the flourishing of the people led. The, the, the leadership is not for the leader. The leadership is for the people, a husband and father. It's, it's a leadership for your wife and your children, for their flourishing. It, that's what it's for. So, brothers, how is it? How is the flourishing in your home? How is the flourishing in our church? Big brothers and big sisters, do you care about the progress of your little brother, your little sister? Are they flourishing under your 
leadership in the workplace? Are you leading in a way that promotes the flourishing of those that follow your leadership wherever you're working? Biblical leadership is to promote and produce those kinds of things. Now, the story goes on. You know, Eli's a last judge, really bad one. Then Samuel comes up. Maybe he's the last judge. He's a really good one. And he sets the table for the first king. Saul starts really well. Well begun is not half done. He finishes badly. And then David's raised up. And he's, he's put as this example. And every other king after is judged by David's example all the way through first and second kings. But David messes up too, doesn't he? And the people flourish some, but not completely. And he points beyond himself. This horror of judges is pointing to David and the king. There was no king, but there's going to be. But then David's failure points forward to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. David was a failure, and every earthly king is, but Jesus never failed and never will. Is he humble? For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Is he (laughs) word-centered? Yeah. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only does he know it and abide by it, but he is it. Does he know how to lead himself? Yeah. He never sinned in any way. Does he know how to lead his people into flourishing? I am come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you know him? Have you ever taken the burden of your failed leadership and laid it on him, understanding that he died to take it all away, every sin, every stain, to cleanse it and remove it and make you whole? Have you ever seen with the eyes of your heart him dying in your stead on the cross, bearing your sin, the wrath of God for it, your guilt, your shame, All of it, all of your heavy load laid on his shoulders. Have you ever seen that by faith, turning away from your sin, trusting in Jesus? If you never have, then do it now. Turn to him now. Don't try to be a good leader without Jesus. You'll fall flat on you. You will face plant. But give your life to Jesus in repentance and faith. Trust him. Start following him. And he really can make you new. He's such a good king and such a good shepherd. And you simply have to know him. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Is that you? And come home to the good shepherd. Let's pray. Lord, our hope is not in earthly kings, and our hope is not in earthly pastors or husbands or fathers. Our hope is in you, taking on flesh and dwelling among us, living without any trace of sin, dying in the place of sinners, rising victorious, ascending to the Father, interceding for your people, returning to make us, to bring us home to take your bride without any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, holy without blemish. Our hope is in you. May it be so as we sing it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.